approaching God. And I know for a lot of people, most especially, let's look at uh, maybe young Christians, new Christians. Um, well, I'll, I'll say this. I'm, I'm, I'd be willing to, uh, to say that even a lot of our older Christians think that God is in a far-off place and he's not approachable. Okay? Uh, with a lesson that, that, that we've done on the, on the veil, we see that Jesus is our intercessor and that we are able to approach God and he is not in an, a far-off place for us to approach. And actually, uh, we're going to look at some of the things that he actually wants us to seek him. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, uh, ask his blessings upon this lesson, uh, this teachings, and uh, that we'll understand and apply this and know that he is approachable. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you for your, uh, your son, who is our high priest, that does come to you and, and intercede for us. Father, we thank you for these words that uh, you have given us to study and to apply to our lives that we uh, will and may come to realize that you are approachable. Father, we give you praise and glory in everything that we do. And Father, we just ask your blessings upon everything that's done here today. Amen. Does God ask us to seek him? We've got scriptures that will back us up and... I will say today I'm going to uh, do something I don't do all the time. Uh, I am going to use my Bible on, uh, on my phone. And the reason being, I've got three different translations on there, and I want to use some of all three. Um, I, uh, I have to admit that I am a New King James fan. There are those that will not listen to anything or read anything. In fact, I heard someone say one time that they didn't believe anything but the King James because that's one Jesus pact. I've, I've heard that. All right? A little 1,500 years, a little late for that. But anyway, <clears throat> what my thoughts on that is this, that if God can speak to us through, um, you know, a Pharisee from... Uh, Jerusalem, if he can speak to us to, from a, a fisherman from Galilee, if he can speak to us through uh, an engineer from Mediacom, if he can speak to you through a uh, superintendent from the park system, he can speak to you through these different translations too. And uh, sometimes it just it sheds a little light to it. And I want to use that today. If you would, turn with me to Isaiah 55. Isaiah chapter 55, and I'm going to start uh, just a couple of verses here, verses 6 and 7. Now, I'm going to use these verses here uh, out of the Amplified Bible, and keep in mind as we go through this, the question I ask first, does God ask us to seek Him? And here in verse 6 says, Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call on Him for salvation while He is near. Let the wicked leave behind his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion or mercy as the Amplified Bible says in parentheses on him. All right. Now, if you would, let's go to Amos. Amos chapter 5. Verses 4 through 6. For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me, search diligently for me, and regard me as more essential than food. That's one thing about the, uh, the Amplified that sometimes helps me, or what was the true meaning here. And these are in parentheses here. It says, Seek, uh, search, more, uh, search diligently for for me and regard me more essential than food so that you may live. But do not resort to Bethel to worship the golden calf, nor enter idolatrous Gilgal, nor cross over to Beersheba and its idols, for Gilgal will certainly go into captivity and exile, and Bethel will come to nothing. Seek the Lord 
search diligently for him and long for him as your most essential need so that you may live. Now, I do want to get into a little bit of the history here with um, uh, the Bethel, Gilgal, and Beersheba. What he's referring to here, he's, and, and if you remember, um, Jeroboam built the first calf in Bethel, okay? And if you go into the, the, the other searches, you see that these other places talking about Gilgal, they did the same thing. They had their calves, uh, Beersheba, they had their other pagan, and what he's, uh, the scripture is telling us here, don't enter into those pagan relationships. Don't seek after them because they're going to burn and, and go away. Also, uh, there's even more significance here that he's talking to the house of Israel because Israel had gone into these places and they had accepted this lifestyle, these other religions. He had actually taken, um, uh, they had taken some of the society and things that were commonplace for society. And I want you to uh, think about this as we're going through these scriptures. Our society, society today has done a lot of these same things. We have welcomed in the paganism, all right? And here they actually incorporated them into the religious services, okay? They had incorporated them in, and he says, do not be like them. Do not go back to Bethel. Do not go back to Gilgal because you have uh, perverted my religion. Now, if we want to go on down, uh, I think I can remember this. I think it's in verse 21. We'll see what he says about that. Because they had infiltrated this paganism into their religion. Let's look and what, see what God says to them here. He says, I hate, I despise, and I reject your sacred feast. And I do not take the light in your solemn assemblies. In other words, he does not take the light in them gathering together in this church service, all right? Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them, and I will not even look at the peace offerings of your fat, fattened animals. Take the noise of your songs away from me. They are an irritation. I shall not even listen to the melody of your hearts, but let justice run down like waters. All right? So that's why he put this in here, uh, mentioning these three different areas, uh, Bethel, Gilgal, and Beersheba. He is wanting them to return or turn away from that and come to the true religion. He approached him for their needs, okay? Um, if you notice in that, he said that their sacrifices were rejected. And during the study, one thing that came to me, what is our greatest sacrifice to God. What is our greatest sacrifice to God? Yeah, he likes our tithes. He likes our gifts. He likes our talents. More importantly, he wants the sacrifice of us. Okay? He wants the sacrifice of us. And that's what these people here had gotten away from uh, he's, he's wanting them to return to him and seek back to him. Uh, if you look in, in Matthew 7 and Luke 11, 9, um, I'm going to read these here for you. It says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be, will be opened to you. Those are scriptures that we all know. And it gives us, what I'm trying to do is build a foundation here for you to know that, that we're building and learning the will of God. All right, he wants us to knock, he wants us to seek. All right, James 4, 8, in the first part of that says, come near to God and he will come near to you. Okay, so we're starting to see here that first question I asked, does God ask us to seek him? All right, and I'm going to go ahead and turn the page here. He wants us to seek him and he's wanting us to make that sacrifice and develop uh, and, and delve in to him wholeheartedly, he wants 
all of us. Now, here's the next question for you. Does God want us, uh, does he wait for us, or does he come to us seeking us? A little of both, all right? There's going to be a little bit of both here. Um, John, chapter 6. I'm going to go back to my Amplified. John, chapter 6. Verses 35 through 44. And Jesus replied to them, I am the bread of life. The one who comes to me will never be hungry, and the one who believes in me as Savior, in parentheses, will never be thirsty. For that one will be sustained spiritually. And like I say, that is the difference in, in the... Uh, the Amplified Bible, it does have these things in parentheses, and uh, most especially for a new learner, I think it adds something to it. It says, for, they, uh, for that one will be sustained spiritually. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All that my Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me, I will most certainly not cast out. I will never, never reject anyone who follows me. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me. Now, usually whenever he says something like that, you need to pay attention to what he's fixing to say, all right? This is the will of him who sent me, okay? This is the will of him who sent me, that all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but that I give new life and raise it up that last day. In other words, I came to give life to everyone who's willing to make that sacrifice and come through me, okay? He said, that's what, that's the, that is the will of the Father. And when you know my things go all the way down. All right. I'm getting to the point of that. Uh, rise up that last day. For this is my Father's will and purpose, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in Him as Savior will have eternal life, and I will raise Him up from the dead in the last day. Now, I'm going to drop down now to verse 44, because here, at this point, Jesus is saying, for those who seek me, okay? For those who seek me, this, this is what uh, the Father's will is. But, look at here. Verse 44 says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Okay? So do you see this here that between what Jesus done on the cross, he said, I will send you a comfort. We all know that those verses. He said, I will send you a comforter. And through the relationship with that comforter, God will draw you towards him. Okay? Now, Jesus said there, he said, uh, and I will raise them up from the dead in the last days. It is written, the prophets, and they will all be taught of God. Everyone who has listened to and learned from the Father comes to me, not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is with me, with the Father, and who is from God. He has seen the Father. In other words, he's saying, if you have seen me, okay, you have seen the Father, and I am, he has laid the groundwork of the will of God drawing you to him. Now, how do we approach God? We, see, we know now that he, God wants us to seek him. We also know that uh, we, um, he will draw us to him. Now, how do we approach him? And if I ask each and every one of you this, this question out in the open, individually, there's probably going to be a different answer. You know, this is how I approach. Okay? This is how I approach God. But how about that new beginner, that new Christian, who still thinks that God's in a far-off place. I've had somebody tell me one time that they pictured God 
floating around on clouds, okay? He said that you are the temple of God. I know y'all seen Robert say, well, whenever we pray, we pray like it's here because God's right here, all right? He does live within us once we make that commitment. But how do we approach God? John 14, 6 says, Jesus told, and he's talking to Thomas here, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Okay? Now, if you remember my teachings the last time, I said that Jesus, whenever he uh, died on the cross, and he came and that veil was ripped. When that veil was torn, Jesus became that new high priest. Okay? So God is approachable now through Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. All right? Romans 5, 2 uh, says, Because of our faith, all right? Now, do we, want, we do want to circle that. Because of our faith, okay? Christ has brought us into a place of undeserved privilege. All right? I'm going to expand on that toward the end, so I want to hold off on it. But keep that in mind, that Christ has brought us into a place of undeserved privilege. Um, I, I will add this. That undeserved privilege, if you remember under the old law, who took your prayers of intercession before God? The high priest, okay? The high priest went in, and quite literally, as, as I mentioned through, about the veil last week, they had, uh, as estimated, 200 people had to pull the veil back for him to get in. So you got one person going in, but you got 200 people out here saying, I wonder what's going on in there. Is he going to accept that sacrifice this time? Okay? So, for that priest to go in, that was an undeserved privilege because when that priest went in, he also sought forgiveness for his own sins. Okay? So, whenever it says here, because of our faith, our faith in Christ, Christ has brought us into a place of undeserved privilege. In other words, we get to enter into the Holy of Holies ourselves. Okay? We can enter into the Holy of Holies. We can, God's not in that far off place. It says, where, where we now stand, and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. All right? It tells us that we can approach that undeserved place and not only approach it, but we can approach it with our shoulders back and our head up with confidence, knowing that we're justified being there through our faith in Christ. Okay? We can do that with confidence. And look here joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. Whenever God told us that we are adopted into his family and we are joint heirs of Christ, he meant it, okay? He meant it. He said that you can joyfully look forward to sharing this glory. Ephesians 3.12 says, Because of Christ, our faith in him we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. We've all heard that before, okay? I had a, ch a chance, I was talking to someone this week uh, at work, um, which I'm always glad that I can actually talk stuff like this here at work. Um, somebody uh, w was talking about, you know, things that's going on in their life, and they said that they had seen somebody at, at town Actually, as one of our co-workers, and they didn't look at them. They just sort of walked by, and they, they're in their own zone. They don't look around. And, and I told them, I said, one thing that I have learned from my study is that by being a child of God, by being a, a believer and having put my faith in Jesus, whenever I go anywhere, I try to put my shoulders back, and I keep my head up so everybody knows that I am a child of God. I am not defeated. 
I said, whenever I, I told this person that was, said that they walked through uh, the campus at Murray State like it's here because they're uh, in a zone, I said, when you look defeated, when you walk defeated, you open yourself up for uh, people to come against you. So as, as Christians, that's, that's the way we, I, I feel like we should perceive or be perceived that we are not defeated. All right? And how many of us know somebody like that that claim to be, you know, and I'm not meaning this in a judgmental way, be Christians to be, uh, you know, born again and follow Jesus, they'd follow Jesus anywhere? Well, uh, that's a defeated attitude, and we cannot have that, all right? Because we have, when it says we have overcome, we have overcome all of that. When you look defeated, people will attack, okay? Do not be, uh, uh, walk around looking defeated. It says, because uh, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. What role does the Holy Spirit play in this? I'm going to read all this one for you. Ephesians 2, chapters, uh, verses 16 through 18. And that he might reconcile them both, Jew and Gentile, united, in one body to God through the, through the cross, thereby putting to death the hostility, and he came and preached the good news of peace to you, the Gentiles, which is us, who were far away, and peace to the Jews who were near. Verse 18 is one I want you to pay attention to. For it is through him that we both have a direct way of approach in one spirit to the Father. Whenever Jesus said that he is going to send a comforter, he is going to send the Holy Spirit to us, whenever he mentioned the Jews and the Gentiles, the Holy Spirit was going to unite both that we all have the same equal approach to God. For it is through him that we both have a direct way of approach in one spirit to the Father. Now, I'm going to go to the one verse that I've been wanting to get to. I've said all that to get to this. Not many times do I teach, and Albert can agree with you here, <laughs> or agree with me, do I teach on one lesson, uh, on one verse, and get done anyway. So I'm going to get done early today. This is Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. And I will say this, all of today, if God doesn't change my mind, which he has been prone to do, will lead into a couple more on the Approaching God series. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. There's a lot of information in there. And one thing I do want to try doing today, because you've heard me mention before, there's times that I think we as Christians get to talking over people's heads. Uh, so I want to take this opportunity on this one verse to go back and let's simplify this down. It says, let's approach God's throne of grace with confidence that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in a time of need. All right, first of all, we have to do this in faith. What is faith? Whenever we put our faith in Jesus, we have to accept him as our Savior, okay? To simplify it down even more, if you have not admitted your sins, and a sin, to simplify it even more, is not living up to the gods that God has set and would like for you to live in, okay? That is sin. It falls short from what God expects of you and would like for you to live in. If you have not admitted those sins and accepted that sacrifice that Christ made and believe that Christ is who this says he is, 
and it says, and he done what it's, he's, uh, this says he's done, and confess that, there is no faith there. All right? So whenever you talk, you, we, these scriptures we looked at of our faith in Christ, if you have not done those things there, there is no faith. All right? You've not made that commitment. Okay? So, to approach God's throne of grace, and if you look down a little further, and mercy. I think it's very important that new uh, Christians understand the difference. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. Okay? So, whenever it says here, let us then approach, and in some of these it does say in faith, let us then approach God's throne in faith of grace with confidence. Okay? Confidence in what? Confidence in that Jesus is who this says he is, and he done what he said he done. Okay? So we can ap approach God's throne at that time, and let's look at here what it says, and find grace to help us in our time of need. So the obvious question that comes with that, to help us in our time of need, is what? When do we go? When do we approach the throne of God? The big things? Man, I've got a major issue going on this week. God, I think I'm going to come talk to you. No. You know, that sometimes that need to go out and sit on a park bench and forget everything for five minutes is a bigger need than the $10,000 you need. That's when we need to approach him. Approach him with the little things. And what you'll see is whenever you start approaching God with these little things, the big things are going to start falling into place. Someone told me one time, if you take care of the nickels and dimes, the quarters will take care of themselves. And that's the same way here. God don't just want to, uh, yeah, he's willing and he'll do it. He don't just want us on our big trouble days. I know and that's been a, a theme here not, uh, for the last little bit that he wants even the little problems. Bring the little problems to him. Is there a reason behind that? Most definitely. Because whenever we start interacting with him on these little things and conversing, that's the way the relationships are built. Okay? That's the way the relationship is built. And through those little things, there comes another, uh, even greater understanding of God's will because in those little things, he teaches us, you know, when we can rely on him on those small things, We've all got that one friend that when something really, really goes bad, we go to and say, hey, this is what's going on in my life. That's what God wants us to do. He's not floating around on a cloud, hard to reach. We have got a direct line. It said there, as I, just a moment ago, I read, it says that uh, for it is through him that we have both uh, that we both have a direct way that Holy Spirit that comes and lives in us the comforter that's a, the best messenger service you've ever seen okay the best messenger service you've ever seen because through that Holy Spirit is how we approach God's throne and that's how he returns the answers just like whenever we started here, uh, that, that God does draw us to him, that is through the Holy Spirit. It draws us to him, and we also communicate with the same thing. So, I'm going to shut this down. I say this is more of a precursor, unless it gets changed, of how we should approach God. The, the basic fundamentals, and to know that Nothing pleases God more than we do approach him. 
he gave, he sent his son to open that door. He sent his son to rip that veil. So keep that in mind as we go forward. I say uh, I had been chewing on this for some time. Robert called me Friday, said, Man, is there any way you can teach? And I had not actually delved into this, so hopefully over the next couple of times of teaching, we're going to look at this a little deeper and find that we have that open door to approach God. Be blessed and be a blessing.